I came from New York City to live the main life. I was hired to design outdoor footwear. I live the main life. We're looking for college grads, so come get your check. I came from Venezuela to live the main life. I opened my own restaurant. Learn more about hundreds of Maine jobs and our tax program for college grads at liveandworkinmaine.com. Hey everyone, greetings from Times Square. We are here in the Big Apple promoting one of Maine's biggest delicacies, clearly Maine lobster. Here's a look at what's coming up on this week's episode. Lobsters in Maine are the best lobsters in the world. Got half a dozen lobstermen here, and we're about to tell some good stories. Fireflies are burning bright. Thanks for joining us. I'm Erin O'Valley. This is Maine After Midnight in New York City. You're watching Maine Life. An echo of an echo is the semblance of a sound And I've pressed and I've waited with my ear upon the ground All of her, I'll see you there Waiting in the willows with your autumn hair All of her, I'll see you there After many months So you can take the kids out of Maine. But why would you? Because we're in New York City. Right. That's <laughs> Here, why. yes. Go to celebrate Maine, really. Maine lobster. Maine lobster. Maine new shell lobster. Maine after midnight. So you know a lot more about this than I do. This is Barton Seaver. Happens to be a former neighbor of mine. Proud Freeport resident, author, chef. And we are here at Jonathan Waxman's amazing restaurant jams in Central Park. Um, New Shell, what, to talk a little bit about what we are going, what's going on upstairs. We are here with uh, approximately 200 members of the media, chef community from here in New York City, and we are celebrating at what we're calling Maine After Midnight. These are events we throw. Uh, we've been putting them on around the country, and uh, New York is, is one of the top spots uh, to really just showcase and show off Maine New Shell lobster. And it's such a, an awesome opportunity to take the kids out of Maine and let them run free a little bit and uh, show the world why Maine is really the way life should be. Folks upstairs are getting a taste of what we, I guess, have at our fingertips every single day. Most people don't understand that lobster is a seasonal ingredient, that it has subtle nuances from hard shell to new shell, uh, and that during the year the, the market shifts and changes. and. Uh, what that does is when we explain this to people, it just opens up their minds to this new ingredient that they're like, whoa, wait, I thought I knew lobster, and but it offers them an opportunity to think anew about an ingredient they thought they were familiar with. You are an author. You talk a lot about in your book sustainability, and that's important to you and your mission. Talk a little bit about uh, what people need to know. Well, uh, sustainability is something that I've long practiced uh, and, and sort of advocated for, but uh, for a long time, really only from an environmental perspective, uh, really looking at the biological world. But what I really began to realize is what I think really matters is really the biography of sustainability, that we're looking at the communities that we're ultimately trying to sustain through our efforts. And that's why I'm so pleased and proud to be able to be a part of this, to be invited by Maine's most charismatic and, and legacy uh, industry mm -hmm. to help represent the men and women who are our neighbors, who right. toil to put food on the plates of uh, folks all over America and the most delicious food there is, too. Before we introduce you to what's ahead, plug how many books now? What's the latest? Oh, uh, my wife and I, we're on number seven. So coming out in November, November 7th in 2017, called American Seafood. Uh, narrative history of the American seafood industry as told by the people, products, and places that have uh, long since rep represented this maritime nation. Well, I hope I've been in his kitchen a few times with his wife, Carrie. Hey, Carrie. I hope to be invited back so we can talk a little bit more about Anytime. that. 
and uh, thank you, Barton. Fancy to see you here in the big city. Nice Take a look now at Maine After Midnight. I'm Jonathan Waxman, and you're at Jam's Restaurant, and you're at one hotel at the corner of 58th and 6th Avenue in Manhattan. And we're doing an event called Maine After Midnight. Well, so much of what we do with Maine Lobster is teaching about the animal and about our story. Got half a dozen lobstermen here, and we're about to tell some good stories. How long have you been lobstering? It's been almost 20 years now. I started with my dad when I was about nine years old. Uh, he never paid me a dime until I was like 10. I, and uh, so I had some money saved up through him. And I went out and bought myself a little boat and, and got going on my own and just worked my way up over the years. And, and here we are. There's so many things in the culinary world right now that have changed over time. People want to hear about a sustainability story. We've got a great one to tell. They want to hear about a farm to table story and there's no better story than our fishermen. And what we're finding is when we put chefs and lobstermen together, there's a certain magic that happens. And I think there's a mutual respect for the animal and for each other's hard work and it just changes everything. Number one, it's the most sustainable seafood. It is actually the most perfect food one can put in your mouth, but it's also the most versatile. You could poach it, you could saute it, you can grill it, you can serve it cold, you can serve it hot, you can serve it raw and sashimi. Maine lobster is a magical creature. I'm about sustainability and practicality, but I'm also about what things taste like. Lobsters in Maine are the best lobsters in the world. Lobster is that perfect thing. You know, you can take it from the sea to the table, and there's no one intervening except God and you. And that's, not, that is, that's pretty magical. We have a seasonal delicacy that not a lot of the world knows about, that they should know about. Um, and we've got an incredible story behind it with our individual fishermen, our owner-operated boats. I mean, there's nothing like it. We have a good story. We don't know it in Maine, but we have a really great story. We've been uh, staying above 100 million pounds for a few years now, and there's really no sign that it's going to ease up poundage-wise. And it's not that the effort has increased. The, the effort is the same as it's been since the 80s. The ocean is just offering us more. So as a fisherman, you take what the ocean can offer you and try to leave you know, the rest at, at what it is. Lobstering is the lifeblood of the economy in the state of Maine, and we want to make sure that protect it for the next generation. This is our seventh event like this. We know it works. Um, so it's, it's pretty gratifying to come and actually put it in motion. This is a product that people love, and once they know the story behind it and they can fall in love with the place and people that, that produce it, I mean, it just, it sells. This event puts lobster on menus. It, it just, it gets the story out there and yeah, what a cool thing to be part of. It's your picnic table and your park bench. It's your hotel room, your office, and your nursery. It's your first date and a shoulder to cry on. It's your barber shop, your dance floor, and your toolbox. It's your car. Find it at Quirk. And this week at Myro Studios, we're switching it up a little bit with country musician Joseph Gallen. I grab my shirt, my guitar, you slam the door behind me. You can keep a black notebook with the songs I wrote. Cause they just remind me of times when we were smiling I said this was forever, now our dream is breaking down And I can't glue it back together I've changed my mind, the same red light 
every time. Joseph, go walk us through like you know your relationship with Maine. Like how long have you been here? You know where did you live? I've actually lived in Maine my whole life. I grew up in Bath. Uh, went to high school in that area, and then I went to college in Farmington. So I've been a Mainer my whole life. Tell us about songwriting, being a country musician in Maine. There's not sure. a lot. Uh, yeah. And there's not a lot of acting ones, and so what's yeah. it like? What's the struggles? What's the joys of it? Being from Maine, and I feel I feel like Maine is like one of the most country states, so it kind of surprised me there's not more of it. I think uh, from like a songwriting standpoint, a lot of it exists, but maybe not necessarily in the traditional sense. You know, a lot of my stuff is is based, and when I'm picturing these stories that I write, they, they would take place at a place in Maine, whether it be, you know, uh, out on a, a lake or on Wharf Street or yeah. wherever it might be, you know? So I think it, uh, it, maybe not, not necessarily by name, but it shines through in the songwriting, I think. I ain't you turn, try to make you turn your heart around. I finally figured it out, what it is you're about. Now I'm getting up this merry go round, stringing me along. It doesn't make sense, nothing that you can say or do to get another chance. Live and Work in Maine is a statewide organization that partners with Maine employers to help attract and keep people here to live and work full time. Our partnership with Maine Life helps to tell their stories. Hey everyone, in this week's business segment we are taking a road trip to Madison, Maine. Very excited, I have never been. Madison, Maine is home to backyard farms where they truly grow the best tomatoes. Let's go check it out. Welcome to Backyard Farms, Aaron. You're standing in the largest greenhouse in all of New England, 42 acres, all under glass, and we're producing anywhere from 25 to 30 million pounds of fresh tomatoes year-round, every year. We always say we grow for quality, not quantity, so we are truly focused on producing the best-tasting tomato we possibly can, and there's nothing we won't do to accomplish that. So the tomatoes on the vine are the clusters, that standard go-to that people want each week, beef steaks, and then cocktail tomatoes, the ones that you're seeing in this compartment. Each row is an eighth of a mile long, and there's 300 of them. It's a big facility. It's very hard to articulate. It's kind of like trying to describe the Grand Canyon to someone. It's that amazing, like until you actually get in here and see it. I don't know if you can really comprehend it. First and foremost, we are year round. Right in the dead of winter, it'll be 70 degrees in here. Tomato plants, bumblebees buzzing around. While we are growing year round, it's a different experience every day. We're subject to interesting weather conditions uh, and we employ a personal gardener system. What that means is every crop care person gets 10 rows of plants that they take care of from the time the plants arrive about this tall to anywhere from 40 to 46 weeks later when they're anywhere from 45 to 50 feet tall. With the personal gardener system, it, it shows a sense of ownership and responsibility. There's a sign in front of their little area. I know that the leadership team really cares about the people that work here in the greenhouse. We really care about how they feel, not just about the work, but you know how they're feeling in, uh, per, in terms of personal development and what kind of opportunities we can offer them. And that's really important. Every decision that we make, we're always asking how does it impact the employee and you know what is the right thing to do for them. Being in a 70 degree environment is unlike anything else Bad. on the planet. <laughs> but what I really love about Backyard Farms is that we really take care of our people. So everyone here is local. 210 employees generally in the winter time. We go up to about 250 in the summertime because when the heat comes on, the plants grow like crazy. Tomatoes are heat loving plants. We have a great impact um, on the environment, of course, being in sustainable agriculture, but also on the local community and on our employees. It's a really close-knit community uh, where you can really set down some roots, pun intended. <laughs> so speaking of which, you set your roots here a while ago, moved out of state. Tell us a little bit about your story. Sure. So I was working in uh, Portland for several years, uh, and I did leave Maine for about eight years. I found a different career opportunity. I've always said Maine's a great place to live, but a tough place to make a living. When Backyard Farms came calling, I was just so happy to answer the bell. One of the things I really love about Maine in general is how beautiful it is on any given day. Even in the winter, it's still beautiful. I really appreciate that. Even in the middle of winter, I'm outside, and that's what I enjoy most. So. Every email that comes to the Backyard Farms website comes to me, so I get to hear all the compliments from our customers, how much they love our product, how much they look forward to buying it every week. Then, of course, I get the ones who tell me that it's the one they buy when they can't grow their own. So what I always like to say is that for the other 46 weeks out of the year, we, we've got you covered. It's when you go into the grocery store and you see our tomatoes next to the competitors, so you see the difference. A lot of the local businesses like to use our tomatoes, so it kind of works as a nice little uh, 
ecosystem of uh, local homegrown stuff that we kind of worked out here, so it's great. I go to events, I have customers or consumers that will come up running to our booth, you know, talking about how much they love our tomatoes. If it has Backyard Farm's name on it, you know it came from this facility right here in Madison, Maine. And it's a wonderful opportunity and it's an amazing company. And the quality of its tomatoes is the best. It really is the best. I do, I do this lobster sauce, and it's, it's, I'll, I'll tell everybody about it, because it's, it's, you take Maine lobsters, and you cut them in half, so you expose everything in the lobster. Take the claws, and you crack the claws, and then you saute them in butter and olive oil, and add onions, garlic, tomatoes, oranges, lemons, limes, and you create a sauce with rosé wine and cognac. Add saffron to that, cook them until the lobster go perfectly cooked, pull them out, pull the meat out, throw the shells back in, pour some more rosé wine on top of that, cook that for an hour, crush the crap out of the, those shells, strain, the, strain the, the broth, reduce it down with cream and butter, add the lobster meat back in. I'm sorry, there's nothing better on earth. Time now to feature our innovators and creators. Here's this week's Game Changer. As a credit union, we're cooperative and we have uh, that very nature built into us as to work together and kind of come up with solutions and it's a people helping people philosophy. And so I think if we have more chance to share more stories of the various organizations out there that you're putting on your show, it's a greater opportunity to other people to jump in and help them expand their cause and do greater and bigger things in our communities. Welcome back to Game Changers. My name is Jess Knox. I'm pleased today to have Shane Diamond with us. Shane, why don't you tell our audience a little bit about the work that you're doing? Absolutely. Uh, thank you for having me. I'm honored to be here. I run a nonprofit here in Portland called Speak About It, and we offer performance based consent education and sexual assault prevention for high school and college students. So, why did you start this project in Maine? I had an opportunity to go to college in Maine. Uh, I went to Bowdoin College. I graduated in 2010, and I was involved in this initial version of Speak About It, and nobody was talking about sexual assault prevention in a way that included healthy sexuality and included the yes part of consent. People were talking mostly about how to not get in trouble and no one was talking about healthy relationships and healthy sexual relationships, ways to watch out for each other at parties or bars. We call that being an active bystander. And I was an actor in that initial version, which was a surprise to everyone because I had zero acting skills. A little bit personable, but that's about it. And I graduated in 2010 and realized this should be everywhere. So I was able to get some of the rights uh, from the college and started the organization in 2010. We've been a nonprofit since 2012. Very lucky to have our roots here in Portland and are excited to be able to travel and build community and build conversation at every school we visit. It sounds, you know, you're taking entertainment, which in some instances where the, the whole conversation about consent is mm -hmm. not, uh, doesn't really manifest itself in right. necessarily a very positive way, and sort of turning it on its head and using it as the medium mm -hmm. for uh, really changing the conversation. Theater has a way to make conversations accessible. It disarms us. It makes us feel like no one is watching because we're sitting in the dark. Uh, it has an opportunity to be fun and funny. We also get a chance to speak from the heart and share stories of students uh, and their experiences with sex, having sex, not having sex, waiting for marriage. We speak very openly about sexual assault, the intersection between alcohol and assault, and we do it hopefully in a way that leaves people talking about it. If we do the show for an hour and nobody continues the dialogue, we haven't done our job. We hope that we can encourage people to keep talking about it, to ask for consent, to be active bystanders. Because you're right, this is kind of an uncomfortable situation, and kind of an uncomfortable topic. No one is taught how to talk about sex, and certainly no one is taught how to talk about pleasure. And so we're, we kind of acknowledge that. This is gonna be uncomfortable. We stage a hookup scene, and there's two folks in a bunk bed, and this particular scene is between a guy and a girl, and he's like, I really wanna ask for consent, but it's gonna be awkward, and she's like, we're in a bunk bed. This is awkward. Everything about this is Everything uncomfortable. Everything about bunk bed is awkward and It's terrible. And, and how do you make that okay. I'm very fortunate as a trans guy to be at the head of this company and so the show is queer friendly. We share perspectives from people of all different sexualities, gender identities, 
uh, having sex, not having sex, waiting for marriage again. What we're really trying to get home is that consent is universal and consent is for everyone. It's not just for straight people. Men are not just perpetrators of sexual assault. Women are not just survivors of sexual assault. And how do you include everyone in this conversation in a way that encourages people to have this dialogue and to talk about this? If people want to find out more information about the project, uh, what's your website? Again, we're called Speak About It, speakaboutitonline.com. You can track us down on Facebook, and we're on Twitter and Instagram at We Speak About It. Perfect. Cool. Thanks for being here. Thanks, Jess. Hey everyone, standing out here on top of Illuminato's roof deck, one of the newest projects in downtown Portland. Here's a look at what's coming up in this week's Main Today Minute. One of my favorite places to visit, Wolf's Neck Farm in Freeport. They are hosting the quintessential fall festival on Saturday with pumpkin hay rides, apple pressing, felted acorns, and face painting. Of course, farm animals, including calves, sheep, and goats, will also be taking visitors. There will be live music all day long, and food trucks will also be on site. It's happening from 10 a.m. to 3 p.m., $8 a person. Kids three and under are free. While we all love Maine's rocky coast, fall is the time to head inland and enjoy all that western Maine has to offer in its most glorious season. Take a drive through one of its scenic byways, stop to see some wondrous waterfalls, and make sure to explore towns like Range Lake, where it's all about the outdoors, and Bethel, where you can stop by the covered Artist Bridge, named because it's so frequently painted. For more ideas and places to explore, log on to maintoday.com. Thanks for joining us, everyone, from our Main Life crew, Carrie, Erin, and Mark. See you next week. And Aaron, as you're having fun exploring New York City on behalf of Maine, we are here at Myro Studios hearing one last song from musician Joseph Gallant. Take a listen to his song, U-Turn. I was a broken heart and didn't care if I'd ever mend It was like everything I did turned into a tangled mess Then when I least expected to find me a little light You came and set my world on fire when you walked into my life for you were mine, I had lost my smile Searching for an answer on a radio dial But only find a static I'd had it Before you were mine, I've come back to life And now that you're by my side And I never thought that I could feel so high I was a sad song, always stuck on replay I could make a sunny morning feel like a rainy day Then when I least expected to find me a little luck You came in and saved me, baby, when you showed me your love before you were mine, I had lost my smile Searching for an answer on a radio dial But only find a static could had it Before you were mine, I've come back to life Now that you're by my side And I never thought that I could feel so high Before you were mine I 
I was lost out on the road and you became my North Star Moving real slow now I'm racing like a sports car Never gonna slow down For you were mine I had lost my smile Searching for an answer on a radio dial